everybody, welcome back to Ripple Live, episode number 29. Mm -hmm. I'm Mark. I'm here with my good buddy, Steve. How you doing, Steve? Hey, Mark. <laughs> hey, guys. Good to see everyone again. Um, we're super excited for our show today. You know, a lot of stuff to talk about. We do. We do. There's, it's been a big week with the new MacBook Pros, uh, updates to Final Cut Pro, Motion, and Compressor. Um, and uh, we've got a bunch of questions from you guys. So I guess, Steve, you're going to take through folks through a little bit about how we do the show before right. we get started. Sure. So the format of the show is simple. Um, you post your questions in the chat and we try to answer them. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we, we never know what questions we're going to get or how many of them. We're going to do our best to answer as many, as many of them as we can. Uh, please don't take offense if we miss a question. Just repost it again because, you know, we're doing all these different things. You know, we have a, a lot of moving parts here. As a matter of fact, um, let me just show you our moving. Let me just, let me just say, turn that off. Huh? Let me just show you our moving parts. So here's my iPhone 13 and I have it connect. Uh, Filmic Pro. Uh, it's got the live HDMI. I just want to show you this is kind of our, this is our setup. So there's, there's Travis. Hey, Travis. Hey and we got everything going through this. Uh, our uh, A-team switcher, and there's my there's my Mac, and there's my iPad. So, thought I'd uh, thought I'd just uh, give you a quick uh, quick tour of the studio. So, it's like you got the wide angle camera there. Yeah, I've got the wide angle lens. So, back to the format of the show. Post your questions. We'll try to get to, get to them. Um, if you absolutely have to get a question answered, there is a super chat function. If you click super chat. You can donate whatever you want. Um, we would appreciate it, and it helps out, you know, to underwrite the, the show. Um, again, whatever amount, and, but that will ensure that your question goes to the top of the heap, and we'll answer that question before the others. Uh, also, we are going to be answering questions that uh, were pre-submitted. Um, we have an email list, and um, I don't know, if, can you bring that up? No, I'm going to say uh, we have an email list that you can um, get notified of these things in advance when we do these. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll post it right now, Steve. Okay. So, you know, so if you aren't already on that list, I'm just posting a link to the Creative Cafe newsletter um, that you'll get notified, you know, next time we do a show so you can submit a question in advance. That's right. Okay, so good. So that's really the format of the show. Um, so we're going to, the way it normally works is I do a demo or Mark does a demo and then we answer questions. And then Mark does a demo. So we have two uh, major demos. I say major demos. Demos related to the new uh, software update. We're going to look at some of the cinematic mode features. Maybe one or two things that I didn't get a chance to cover in our initial um, what's new. And then Mark's going to cover tracking a little bit later. He's, he's got a fun little project to show you with regard to particles. So I don't want to steal his thunder, but it'll be a lot of fun. You want to stay tuned for that. Um, so we'll, we'll do our demos and then we'll answer questions. So we have two main demos and we'll, we'll, we'll also do some demoing if we need to to answer questions. Sometimes it's better to answer that question right on the screen. So yeah, let me just, yes. just, just to add, Steve, I mean, we, we do have people submitted questions in advance and we'll start with those, but please post them here in, in the chat. We'll mm -hmm. get to as many of them as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. And like Steve said, if you want them to really stick out, you can do the little super chat thing and it'll pin it to the top there and we can see it. But we'll get through as many as we possibly can and we'll go for an hour to, you know, maybe a little over the hour if it, uh, if it warrants it. All right. So I thought we'd, uh, we'd tee up the first feature, the cinematic mode editing. So before we actually get into it, um, we, we didn't make this clear in our video and we had a lot of questions about that in order to utilize cinematic mode in Final Cut Pro 10.6, you have to be on Mac OS Monterey, um, which for whatever reason, we didn't include that in the video. And so I just want to make that clear, Mac OS Monterey for cinematic mode editing and Final Cut in motion. Um, Monterey will be available, I believe Apple said on the October 25th, and uh, then it will appear, your cinematic modes clip will be the cinematic mode clips will be there. I'm actually a developer, so I've had, had, I've had, I have access to the public beta of Monterey, so that's why I'm able to show you what I'm about to show you today. Um, anything else about uh, the setup or the OS mark that you want to mention? I, I don't think so. I think uh, I'll try to answer some questions uh, through the chat while you do your demo, but why don't you show us uh, what you got going on with the uh, editing you're editing footage that was shot on an iPhone 13 in cinematic mode. Yes. So 
Oh yeah, you just reminded me. I, I'm getting questions from people. Will this work on other cameras besides the iPhone 13? No, it only works on iPhone 13. Um, just because, well, it's just, that, that's all it works with. So how do, before we even get into the cinematic mode tool itself, I'm gonna talk about how to import the clips. I'm gonna reiterate this. You need to bring in the metadata so that Final Cut Pro can recognize the, the cinematic features of the clip. Now, you'll notice here that I have my photos selected from the photo sidebar. So I'm actually looking at my photos library right here. So these are clips from my photos library. And you can, you can see I have all of these different cinematic clips here. And um, my, that's my uh, granddaughter, Edith. And uh, so I could skim over them and you can set range. You can actually set ranges for them before even bringing in, before even bringing them in. You can set in and out points just so you know, you, you can do that or you can just bring in the whole clip. So I'm just going to grab the clip and I'm going to drag it right down into, uh, actually that's not the clip I want to use. I got a better clip because there's a much better clip to show you what I need to show you. Make sure this is the right one. Okay, so this clip, I'm gonna use this one. Drag it right into the timeline. And here I am. Now, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to know is that the clips, well, I shoot everything in HDR. I, 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 I don't know, I love the HDR look on the phone. It's 10 bit. And uh, I just see, for me, I see no reason to shoot standard anymore. Um, I just like having all that extra dynamic range. Even though I'm not necessarily utilizing it for delivering HDR, I, I still like having all that dynamic range available to me. So personally, I always shoot on my iPhone with HDR turned on. But knowing that, you're not, here I'm working in a standard definition timeline, um, Rec 709, you're going to have to take an extra step with these clips. And most of you, well, some of you know this, not everyone knows it, but what you're gonna to wanna to do is go in, into the color preset panel and locate HDR tools, drop it on the clip, like I'm about doing, close up, close up the panel here. And then in the inspector for that clip, you wanna set the mode, by the way, these are HLG clips. Uh, so you wanna do HLG to Rec 709 SDR and bada bing. We're ready to go. That's all you need to do to prep these clips for use in Final Cut Pro. Now, um, the next thing I wanna look at is the cinematic mode tool itself. I'm parked over the clip. And if I scroll down, you'll see there's a, a cinematic option. You're gonna wanna, this has to be turned on. Uh, or you're, not, you're not gonna be able to make any changes. That has to be turned on. And immediately notice it goes from kind of a full, you know, full depth focus to shallow depth focus, whatever, the, however it was recorded in the camera. And then the other thing you wanna turn on is actually the cinematic editing tool itself, which could be this little button right here, or you can do it right here in the drop down menu in the lower left of the viewer. But either way, that has to be enabled so that you can actually see uh, the on-screen control. So you can actually see the um, on-screen controls of the clip. Now, the, the other thing about cinematic mode editing is you're gonna to wanna to, to be able to see those controls. So if I control, right click, I can down and show cinematic editor. And so I have this clip here. For some reason, I'm not seeing my on-screen control, my, uh, let me do that again. All right, so just, so just so you know how I shot this clip, I, I manually set a focus point on this um, bubble machine. So for the entire clip, it's really weird why I'm not seeing the tracking control. Uh, on. You know, enable them like the mask uh, overlays in the inspector. Uh, yeah, it's turned on right now. Let me just go ahead and do a click, click. Yeah, funny, the uh, the overlays are not appearing. Okay, I'll just walk it, walk walk you through it anyway. So I. What's happening here is that this is in focus because I tapped the screen. It's really weird. And uh, now what I wanna do is I'd like to set the focus, that's my granddaughter, she's behind it and, and she's out of focus, but maybe I want her to be the one in focus and the uh, bubble machine to go out of focus. So one thing that I should point out is that 
you, you have a control point, a focus point at the beginning. That's the focus point that I set when I was shooting this clip. So there's one at the beginning. If I delete this focus point, which I'm gonna do, you're gonna see now all of the camera, the, the camera made the decisions of focusing between her and the bubble machine. So the camera is always trying to track something in the frame. It's always attempting to figure out what should be in focus. So even if you do have a manual focus point set, you're still gonna get these, uh, depending if there's more than one subject in the frame. So I'm gonna undo that. And this is where it's gonna get interesting because I can't see the on-screen controls. What I wanted to show you is, um, let me um, let me do this another way. I'm gonna try one other thing. Um, and when, I need to show you this anyway, so this might be a good, uh, a quick diversion over here. So the other way to bring in, um, I will come back to that, but I, I think this might help. Okay, so I'm in the Photos app, and notice in when I'm in the Photos app in the Mac OS, I can tell which clips are cinematic ones and uh, which ones aren't. Where I, When I was in Final Cut, there was no label that said cinematic. These tell me, I, yes, these are in fact cinematic clips, right? And I can, I, I can scrub through them and what have you. So I need to maintain the metadata for this. So here's, and I mentioned this in the tutorial, if you hold down the option key and drag it on the desktop, it will make a copy. You'll get, you'll get the clip with the cinematic metadata, but you'll also get a uh, sidecar file, which, Final Cut's not even using, in fact, I'm not even sure what that sidecar file is for. Uh, I really have no idea, but I'm gonna go jump, I'm gonna take that clip, I'm gonna just drop it in the timeline. And, all right, and uh, let's go ahead and uh, put the HDR tools back on this clip. And uh, I'm gonna do one other thing. If this doesn't work, uh, I am going to Let's turn this on, scroll down, turn on the cinematic, and turn on. All right, I'm going to do one other thing. I started to do this. This is a, we're doing this live. I'm going to quit Final Cut. And I'm going to relaunch it. Sorry about this, but I, it's really hard for me to show you what I need to show you without those on-screen controls. That's what I like about doing these live shows. Stuff like this happens, and I've kind of got to wing it. All right. Come on, come on, on screen controls. All right. All right, let's try it again. Yes! So all it took was a little restart. All right, thanks for your patience. All right, so now let's go back to um, the cinematic editor. And, and I just want to reiterate what I was saying. Okay, so you can see that square. That's where I tapped with my phone and said, okay, that is where I want focus maintained for the entire duration of the clip. And notice you can see that you got my first focus point and the focus on that particular foreground object stays to the end of the clip. But maybe I want to focus on my granddaughter. She's coming in through the frame. Now, I don't know if you see this or not, but there's a, a little light gray circle around this bubble. And it's, it's what it's doing is saying, oh, well, that's a potential tracking point. If I scrub a little bit further, now the square is over here. Here, and Final Cut is saying, well, that's a potential, I, I didn't mean tra tracking or focus point, I meant to say focus point. So whenever you see these gray squares uh, in the frame, that's saying that's a potential focus point for you to choose. So now the thing about this, I deliberately chose this clip because it's challenging. <laughs> what is in focus? My daughter's in, look, that bubble's in focus, then my daughter, granddaughter goes in focus, then the, it's, what's going on here is a lot of stuff uh, that, that's happening here. So I'm gonna show you how to make sure the focus stays on what you want. So like right here, we're about 12 seconds in, I'm not gonna set my focus point here. You could actually set your po focus point somewhere else in the frame. In fact, check it out. If I hold down the option key, and then, and then move my mouse, what's, sh what's showing me is I, what other potential focus points there are in the frame as I move my mouse over the frame. That's cool. In fact, it's very much like the tracker, all right? But I, I really want to, I, let's say, 
that I want the focus plane right here. And in order to set that focus point, I'm just going to double click. And notice it's a autofocus lock 0.3 meters. That's telling you how far the focus, how far the distance from the camera to that particular focal plane. So I'm gonna move my, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and move my playhead a little bit further. And she's still kind of in focus, but like maybe about right here, in fact, it's telling me that I have a potential focus here, but again, I don't want that to be the focus point. I want the focus point to be right maybe there. Double click. I locked it at that point. And then I go a little, and so it's locked. Maybe I want the focus point here. Lock. So I'm locking those focus points. And then maybe I want, as she's leaving the frame, I want to rack focus back to the bubble machine. So at this point, I'm just, I'm going to just double click I could choose this in the square, but I'm not because I don't want the tracking point to be the focus. I want it locked at that point. So I'm going to go ahead and play this, see how it looks. I'm going to play it. Let me go ahead and bring down the audio because you don't need to hear it. Just a bunch of kids. But... All right. So it's uh, out of focus. Then she comes in. She goes into focus. She stays in focus, stays in focus, stays in focus. And then it racks back to the bubble machine. So I really wanted to cover this. Oh, yeah, and, and there's a really cool keyboard shortcut to, to jump to the focus points. Option, shift, command, right arrow will jump to the focus, play it to focus points. Option, shift, command, left arrow will jump backwards to the focus points. So a couple little, uh, so a couple little tricks there that I didn't, cover in the initial one. So I mean, really, really, I, I really messed around with trying to figure, figure out like how to work with this. And those uh, autofocus lock points are super, super important for the, for really, you know, getting that focus where you want to have happen uh, in, in the shot. Now, before I answer your question specifically on this, I have one more thing to show you, which we didn't get to, which is how does this work in Apple motion? So let's, uh, let me jump over to motion. And I'm going to go to File, New. Okay, oh, thank you. Thank you. Fi so I'm in mo I'm gonna, I'm Motion, File, New. And I'm going to show you a feature that a lot of people aren't even aware is there, but I, I should. I mean, I could set a project, but check this out. Down here, Import as Project. This is a super cool button. I'm going to click that button. I'm going to navigate to the clip I want. This is this one. Now, why that button is cool is because if you import a clip using that button, motion will automatically match the resolution and frame rate of the clip you're bringing in automatically and set the project proper properties appropriately for the clip. So I go import project and there she is. Now, this came in as a cinematic clip and notice the focus points are already exposed for the clip in the timeline. So there it is, they're already exposed. The only thing I need to do is like, I need, actually need to see the focus points in or the on-screen control. So I just take my mouse into the viewer, right click, and look at that, there's a new option, cinematic. Boom, now I have cinematic, and I don't know if you could see it, but it's kind of dark, but there's a, a little tracking square right there over Edith, my granddaughter. And if I go over here, you'll see, you could, there's a track. So if I wanna set the tracking here, just say, there's, Double click, I can lock it, I can lock the auto track her, and then she stays in focus, and then she's still in focus, and then she reaches for the apples. So now I'm gonna just double click, I'm gonna set the focus point right where her hand is. She goes slightly out of focus here. And then come back and maybe right there, I wanna be back on her face. She's looking at these apples, so I wanna be back on her face, double click. I just, um, honestly, this is, this is one of the, this is super fun tool to work with. You know, uh, I, you know, I don't like to use the term game changer very often because it's so overused, but this to me is a game changer. The fact that you can do this in post is just freaking amazing to me. Um, in fact, I mean, I'm looking at this clip, which I shot on my, you know, I would should normally shoot on my Sony a7S III. But, but it, it looks so good that, and it, because the iPhone is the camera that's always in my pocket, I have, I'm gonna, I shoot a lot of stuff like this. Now, that, that side, that aside, there's a couple, one other thing I wanna show you is uh, in the inspector, 
uh, if you go to properties, you'll see that the cinematic mode is under properties and you'll see the depth of field slider exposed in the uh, properties tab. So there, there it is. I'm just showing you and it, and it can be keyframed just like Final Cut Pro. So, all right. So I know I, so I know I, I talked a lot. I hope you, hopefully uh, you learned a few tips there. Uh, thanks for being patient as we work through the uh, little, uh, little bugaboos. But uh, Mark, back to you. Yeah, great, great recovery. That was very cool. I was going to mention uh, the thing about being able to adjust the amount of depth of field after the fact because that's a really great thing. You can throw things more out of uh, out of focus and more into focus to a certain extent afterwards, which is really cool. Um, I, I'm going to answer a couple questions sure. that were submitted before. I do want to just Steve. There was one question that you may want to think about while I'm answering the other ones that. Uh, that was posted by uh, Kurt Bailey, who said, not long ago, you did a demo uh, about setting up your workspace with pre-populated keywords. Does that make any, ring any bells? Pre-populated keywords. Yeah, just think about it. I said, right. look, if we can't remember what it is, send, a, send an email to support Ripple Training. It doesn't, I don't remember something specific. Right. Um, but I do want to get some of these, you know, people were uh, kind enough to submit us some questions in advance. Yep. And I thought we'd go through a few of them. Uh, the first one I'll take, we're kind of just doing them in order they came in here. There was a question, will I now be able to view and grade wide color HDR on the display of the 16-inch MacBook Pro Max? Uh, should I upgrade to 64 gigs of RAM if all I'm really getting into is a few tracks of 4K, occasionally 6K from my S1H for documentary production? Okay, multiple questions there. Um, no, I, the main thing I'll say is nobody really knows on the new Macs. I don't think they're called Mac Pro Max. You can get them with the M1 chip, either the M1 Pro or the M1 Max, and you can get it with different SSDs and different number of cores. There's a lot of configuration options, and there's a bunch of good videos out there going over those options. Um, Nobody really knows yet. Personally, I don't think 64 gigs of RAM is going to be necessary for most people um, because the new M1 architecture, even on the existing M1s, utilizes RAM in such a different way that people are able to do things with 8 gigs of RAM that they could never do before. So I, I think 64 gigs of RAM on the, on the MacBook Pro is overkill. I actually have an order in for one with 32 gigs of RAM in the M1 Max and a two terabyte SSD. So I don't think you need that much. The question about grading an HDR on the laptop screen is, um, is tricky. Okay, so I'm gonna, give you, I'm gonna give you two answers in my opinion on this. The, the first is if you're gonna grade in HDR for delivery to Apple devices, meaning other uh, new Mac laptop Pro, MacBook Pros that have the new high knit screens, the HDR screens, and to iPads and to you know iPhones, then absolutely you can. I would say you can with confidence use a new MacBook Pro's uh, HDR screen to do an HDR grade for other Mac devices with confidence. Uh, if you're doing it for the web for browsers that support HDR, my answer is probably you're mm -hmm. probably going to be fine. If you're doing it for broadcast, you're doing it for streaming services for Netflix, whatever. Um, I would say probably not. And I think anybody who's doing this professionally would, would say definitely not, <laughs> that you're going to want to go out to a, a full uh, calibrated HDR monitor that's going to be expensive. So I really think it depends on the delivery target. Um, but that being said, I'm super excited about these new, much brighter screens. Awesome. Um, Steve, before that, there was a question that I think you wanted to address about color coding clips in the timeline. Yeah, but, uh, yes. Before I get to that, there was a question on stills. Here's a question. I've been making videos with stills, and although I set the default time to four seconds, when the stills are placed in the timeline, they end up at 10 seconds. What am I missing? Okay, well, let's, let's tweak it. I think this is good for everyone to, to kind of see. So I'm going to go back to my... Uh, I'm going to go back to my photos library and uh, I'm going to choose uh, for all photos and it will take a second to propagate. All right. Um, yeah, at least it scrolls pretty fast and uh, yeah, well, I guess I just wait for it to, all right. So let's just, I'm just going to grab, I'm just going to grab, uh, let's see, one of these stills. I'm going to 
still without people without actual people in it um uh that's, uh, that's good. There's me sitting in my office, ah, being weird. So I'm going to grab this and I'm going to drop it into my event, right? This event here. And there it is. There's my still. And notice when I select it, when you click on the clip, it's, it's, it, 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 it creates a selection range automatically. And if I hit control D, you'll notice it says under duration, it says four seconds. Okay. So what if I want the duration longer than that? So I'm going to bring up command comma, bring up preferences under still image is set for four seconds. I'm going to set still image for six seconds. Close the window and you're going to want to, this is the key. You want to clear that range out. Then when you click on it again, the range will be six seconds. Control D, notice the range is six seconds. So when I press E to add it to the timeline, when I add it to the timeline, a six second photo will be added to the timeline. So. That's the answer. Awesome. Um, yeah, so just the, there was a question uh, about color. Can you color code clips in the timeline? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes and no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yes, and, yes, yes and no. Technically, yes. Let's see here. Um, let's see. All right, here. Let's go into here. Give me a second. It's loading up. Uh, da, 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 da. All right. Okay. So let's talk about color coding clips. Okay. Switch. Oh, switch. Thank you. <laughs> I'm tra tra Travis. Is switch. Switch. <laughs> okay. So here I have a timeline, and perhaps I want to color code the clips of the you know of Katie swimming in one color, and maybe I want you know the marine life in another color. It's important to understand that the colors in Final Cut are related to audio roles. You can, there are video roles, but you can assign video role colors as long as there's no audio, that is key. So I can assign a role to, I can assign a, an audio, excuse me, a video role to, to this, as long as they're not, here's what I mean. So if I select it and I go to uh, assign video roles and I choose this purple color, you don't see it, why not? Because there's audio. So if I go to, the audio inspector and then turn off dialogue. Oh, look at that. The color's there. All right. So like, that's cool, but I want audio. So that's stupid. Well, just, you got to hear me out here. So instead of, uh, instead of creating audio roles for, uh, for video, it's, it's actually, it's actually better to create them for audio. So right click, I'm going to just down and choose, let's see. So I'm going to, it was there. What's, was it? Yeah. 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 Let's see. Uh, modify audio roles, edit roles. So I'm going to edit role, role. I'm in the role editor. So I'm going to add an audio role. I'm going to call this fish. And I'm going to add another audio role. I'm going to call that, uh, I don't know, Katie. And so I've got two roles. Now click apply. Remember, these are audio roles. So, so like this is the fish shot. And because it has audio, instead of applying a video roll, I just apply an audio roll. So there's there's Bash, and then maybe these shots of Katie. Maybe I want that to be uh, in a different color. So I got audio rolls, audio rolls, Katie. So you see 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 how this is working here. So it's really the audio rolls. It's a little bit not as you know super intuitive, but it just understand it. It's the audio roll color that's allowing you to apply the color to the clip. So you can create as many colors as you want and assign them to the clips as, as, as I'm doing here. So that's my answer, Mark. Awesome. Hey, I just, I'm, I'm going to get back to our list, but I, a couple people are posting questions in the chat right now that are essentially, do you think that Final Cut is going to have something or another? Do you think it's going to have a get a good warp stabilizer? Do you think that it will uh, support B raw? So let just let me address all those just to. We don't know. Nobody knows what's coming in Final Cut. I shouldn't say that. People who know can't say. People who say don't know. Okay, so we just we can't address what may or may not happen in the future Final Cut. We can talk about what we'd like to see for sure. Um, but have, we just don't know what's what's coming up there. Um, Steve, that was great. Thank you for that. I did the person who asked the question about adding the stills. Their question was, hey, I set the preference for four seconds, but when I bring it in, it comes in at 10 seconds. 
And I, it's, we've never seen that. We've never seen it not respect the preferences. So we'd like to see what you're actually doing. And if that's what's really happening, something's wonky. And I'd suggest you trash your preferences, um, which means we quit Final Cut, then hold down the option and command keys when you launch it. Um, if that doesn't do it, you can quit and reinstall the app. Uh, by the way, I just, you know, we just upgraded. I just want to remind everybody, you should do this now if you haven't done it before. Go to your Final Cut Pro application, the Applications folder, right-click on it, and compress it. Make a compressed version, and then when you do that, name it Final Cut Pro 10.6, if you're up to 10.6. Just that way, if you ever, you know, you, you, turned, you didn't turn off automatic upgrading, if you upgrade to another version of Final Cut, you can always go back to that previous version. Right. Um, anyway, just a little aside there. A um, couple of questions okay. in, the, in the actual, uh, I'm monitoring the chat here. Um, you, you covered HDR. That was a really excellent answer. You know, the ongoing, the ongoing question about Blackmagic, B-Raw, Apple, you know, I always say, you know, it's, it's what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object. That's my answer to that, and we don't. I don't know if we'll ever see it. I mean, you can open it and in, in resolve and in, export ProRes files and bring it into Final Cut. That's the workflow. Unfortunately, that's what we have. That's how you. That's how you do it. I have a Blackmagic 6K Pro, and we love that camera. But that's what we have to do for our Final Cut workflow. Um, okay, so there was a question about um, ADM Adobe Atmos in Final Cut support. I don't know. I'm um, certainly. I don't. It's not supported now, to my um, awareness. Um, maybe it's something that could be added in the future, but I don't believe Dolby Atmos is supported um, in Final Cut, but I could, I could be wrong. So, I don't know. Uh, there was a question about... There's a good question about... Um, oh, William says, someone brought up a keyword and I find it maddening how few choices there are in the HUD uh, for a keyword. Um, William, I, I, I just got to clarify that you're not limited by the number of keywords. You can have as many keywords as you want, hundreds of them. Final Cut's not limiting you. The only thing the Final Cut limits you is the number of registers for presets, for holding them, okay? But you don't, you're not limited, okay? So if there are 10, 10 uh, shortcuts that you use all the time, that's what those registers are for. So I just wanted to clear, clear that up, okay? Um, Steve, let me just, I'll just one in here and then go back to our pre-submitted questions. There was a question about, can you track, track 3D titles in Final Cut? And, and yes, you can. Um, however, if there's turning in this shot, you won't see that the title's not going to rotate, okay? But you can keyframe it to rotate. In fact, in my tutorial, I go into depth about how to do that. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay. Um, just to get some of these questions addressed sure. from earlier sure. on that were submitted. Um, Will there be a drastic speed performance in overall exporting and editing within Final Cut Pro and Motion? And I think that's what, they, what they're asking about is the new hardware, the new MacBook Pros. Uh, we don't know, but we expect so. Yeah. Based on what we've seen with the M1 chip last year on the Mac Mini and the 13-inch and the MacBook Pro, uh, I would expect there to be significant speed increases. And we saw it in the demo, actually, massive increases even versus, I'm on a 2019 MacBook Pro 16 inch, and these new machines just blow it out of the water. So I expect to see huge improvements in, in rendering time, you know, export time, uh, all of that. Yeah, <clears throat> good. Now there's a question about the blade icon being represented by scissors. Uh, you know, <laughs> there, what, I, what, what we're talking about here is, you know, the, under the edit tools, there's a there's now a scissors representing a blade. We kind of were having a chuckle about that a couple the last Mac break. You know, honestly, well, focus on, yeah, focus on oh, it. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Anyway, just, <laughs> you know, my answer to this, uh, you know, I don't mean to be snarky, but I could give less than two craps about what the icon looks like. Uh, I, I never look, use, I never use the menu to, to blade a clip. It's always command B. So I don't know. I, yeah, I think it's there that, because it matches, you know, iMovie's iconography, and they want to keep consistency. Uh, that's what I think. But I, I just, I just, I just don't care. <laughs> that's my answer. All right, Mark. I, I think it should be this guy right here, one of these. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, a couple other submitted questions. Yeah. Um, oh, there's a question that if I if 
um, I'm presenting at the summit or either of are presenting at the summit. I am presenting a few sessions at the Final Cut Pro Summit. If you don't know what that is, I'll post a link to it. It's coming up in November. The Creative Summit has been going every year for, I think, eight years now. Um, and it's virtual this year, like it was last year. Um, but I'm doing uh, episodes, episodes. I'm doing sessions on uh, how to shoot cinematic in with the iPhone, which includes cinematic mode, but just other ways to shoot cinematically with an iPhone. I'm doing a session on working uh, with LUTs in Final Cut Pro, and I'm doing a session on working in the HDR in Final Cut Pro. And I'm doing a, um, uh, what do you call it, a session where you all sit there together and answer questions. I forget what you call it right now. Um, but that thing's going to be great. In, in fact, I don't know if Travis could post a link to that. It's the FCP Summit. I'll try to bring that up when I'm not on yeah, camera. Yeah, it's, it's, you mentioned it's free, right? Yeah, it's free this year. That's Thank you. It's totally free. So uh, I'll post a link to that. And it, so you can just go check out sessions you want to check out because I think that'll be really great. Uh, and it's likely we will offer some kind of post some discount during that session for other, you know, uh, things that we do, tutorials, whatever. So worth checking out. Awesome. Um, what would cause Command Plus to no longer work to expand the scale of the timeline? Zoom in on the timeline. Okay, here's my, here's my uh, timeline, Mark. Zoom in, zoom out. Works fine. I don't. The only yeah. thing you know, you know what, you know what it is. I, I, honestly, go ahead. Go ahead. No, most most of the time it's because people have their, their they they don't have the their command set to the default. They have it on some other thing and they have changed it. But just make sure this is set at the default. But other than that, it works fine. Well, but sometimes things go wonky. They yeah. just do. And and if you see something like that happen, things don't do what you think they do. I mean, one thing I do just quit and restart Final Cut. If that doesn't work, I restart my computer. If that doesn't work, then I'll trash preferences for the, for the final cut. Um, and usually one of those does it and brings it back to doing what it should do. Right. Okay, cool. Um, there's a question about when I turn on motion blur rendering, the last frame of the clip looks like it has a cross dissolve effect. I assume they're talking about motion because you can't turn on uh, motion blur rendering in final cut. So I'm assume it's motion. And I, I'm sorry, I don't know what the answer to that is, what, what you could do is uh, support at rippletraining.com, send a, send a little movie or a screenshot of what you're seeing. Uh, maybe we can help you that way. Uh, Carlos, uh, in the, in the chat, Carlos is asking about HDR footage on the normal HDR and the standard. Well, we, I, Carlos, you're going to have to watch this, go back earlier in the stream. I covered how to deal with that using HDR tools. So a um, couple of other questions here. Is it, Possible do a round trip with cinematic mode FCP to resolve. I would I would think that if mm, I haven't tried it, I I would think no. I, I don't know yeah. if Resolve is going to be able to read the cinematic. I would doubt it. I doubt it. But I would I, I would doubt that Resolve is going to read and retain that metadata. Um, I mean, you can you can round trip, but you might lose the capability of of adjusting the yeah. focal points. Focus then round trip. Um, right. Is there, a way, is there a way to add more LUTs to the built-in LUTs list in the inspector? That's Roco. And yes, in fact, it just it, it tells you exactly uh, how to do it. And maybe I'll do a, a quick demo on that. Let me switch to my uh, Final Cut Pro. If you go to the inspector uh, over in the right here, and you need to be in the either the general or extended view, so the, the camera LUT will pop up, uh, and from here, you can see I've got a whole bunch of LUTs in here because at the bottom it says add custom camera LUT. So you can choose that and then you can navigate to where your LUT is that you might want to use or you can just choose reveal and finder which will pop a finder window open where you can drag and drop any camera LUTs that you want to put in there. And I'm saying camera LUTs because these are different from uh, creative or uh, effect LUTs, creative LUTs that are applied after, usually after your camera LUT. But you can apply it, as you can see, you can put as many as you want in there. But also in the effects window, uh, if you're using LUTs more as a creative look after you've converted to the correct color space, under color, um, if you apply the LUT, uh, I'm losing my mind a little bit here. Custom LUT. If I apply a custom LUT to a clip, and Final Cut's taking a second here. It's not super happy right now. You can't see my screen? <laughs> oh, we, we were muted on the stream. 
All right. Go so back, I, go I back, got back a, to you. Uh, yeah, I got go a, a pinwheel right now. So um, I will come back to right. that if it comes back. Right. And we'll I, can, I, can, I can answer a few more questions that are, that are coming up. Um, a lot of the questions, this came up, it just came up in the chat and it also came up several times in our pre, uh, in our pre-survey, pre-show survey about, um, <laughs> just, I just forgot what is it talking about. Um, oh, the app store. Why aren't the apps showing up? Well, you know, honestly, they didn't show up for me for a while. I, I, it never, they never showed up in the update. So what I ended up doing to fix it was I trashed all my Final Cut motion compressor. I just tra trashed them. Then I went back to the App Store, went to the Final Cut Pro main landing page, and then it had a di download icon, and then I just downloaded them. So I just, for whatever reason, it didn't it didn't show up in my update, but it was easy to get around. The key was- and Steve, you know what I did? Yeah, what I did you something do? a little different. I didn't trash my apps, but it is in the App Store, it wasn't showing up under updates, but I just searched for Final Cut. Yeah. And it, you know, then it shows you Final Cut and then it said, hey, download me. Yeah. So exactly. A little download, little download easy. icon. Yeah. It's super easy. So, you know, it's up there. You can just got to get it. And, and speaking of uh, upgrading, there was some question about, uh, you know, the proper way to upgrade about going from earlier libraries like 10.5.4 10 libraries to 10.6. Uh, Mark and I usually do a, what, you know, a video on like what to do when upgrading. And we didn't do that this time, but. The main thing you've got to remember is that if you need to go back to a pre earlier version of, of, of Final Cut, number one, you're going to want to go into and zip up your libraries so that they're in a, in a zip file. So your 10.5.4 is a zip file and then put that somewhere. The other thing is you're going to want to have a backup of your library, two libraries, a 10.5.6 library and, a, and the one you plan on opening in 10.6. Does that make sense? So you have 10.6 library and then one that's 10.5.4. So if, if you need to go back, and I actually don't see any reason to go back, but if you do, you have both the app and the library in order to do so. Okay. Anything you Very want good. To okay, a couple a couple more questions that were asked that were asked beforehand. Yes. Uh, I'll just jump to a few and put my name next to. There's a few about. Uh, okay, here's a question about the tracker. Um, does the tracker track particles? So um, the answer is uh, yes, um, <laughs> but I think I should show you a, a little demo of this. Yeah, it's cool. Um, this is super cool. So um, this is real quick. So what I did was I published some particles from, from Motion, and I published them into this little category here called emitters. So I just published a black smoke and a flaming exhaust, existing preset particle emitters, and I published some parameters. And in this shot here, um, if I select the underlying video clip and go to the video inspector, I just want to show you I can select the object track so you can see what I tracked here. So you can see I'm tracking one of these Blue Angels. This is a Blue Angels performing at Fleet Week in San Francisco last week, you know, week before. So I just want you to see that. But then what I've done, um, I've added this flaming exhaust. And if you watch, um, that tracks, you know, the camera kind of pulls out and that particle emitter tracks to it, okay? So yes, you can publish particle emitters and track them to objects in Final Cut. Now, the reason I'm not saying yes with great conviction is because the way, the particles don't react to the motion, okay? In other words, uh, let me just show you another example of this. Um, that's kind of silly, but it gets the point across. So here I have, I'll disable that for a minute. I just want you to see um, what I've tracked here. I've got a track on this skateboarder and Final Cut does a shockingly good job at tracking his head with all this stuff going on um, up until it gets interrupted and you can actually fix that. Um, but I'm focused just on he's tracked and then I have this smoke, uh, which is silly, but if you watch what happens, um, you know, there's smoke tracking to him, which is cool, but the smoke isn't reacting to the movement. And if you, in like in motion, when you apply a particle emitter and the object is animated, the smoke would then trail behind it or would, you know, the, the existing particles that came out would stay where they came out. Um, so like a train with smoke with moving along, the smoke would drift behind the train. Um, in Final Cut, it's not interpreting any motion here. So it's just, it's tracking the particles, 
but it's not um, reacting to the motion. So when I did this example with the, um, with the plane, I manually rotated, if you look in the inspector here, I published the emission angle, sorry, the emission angle, so I could manually adjust that to the right uh, angle for it to work. So a little bit of caveat, but, but yes, you can definitely track emitters. Cool. Okay. Cool, cool Mark. Steve. No, I was just uh, I was just answering I was answering questions in the chat while you were doing okay. your demo. <laughs> okay. So I think we're gonna, gonna, uh, this is be the uh, a good time to remind people to uh, put in your questions so we can try to get to, we can get to them. If you absolutely have a question that has to be answered, uh, you can uh, graciously provide a super chat and uh, donate a nominal amount, and we'll uh, we'll answer that question uh, straight away. Okay, so, yes. I, there's a couple more questions regarding the tracker maybe sure. I could yeah. address sure, both, absolutely. both in, the, in the chat here. So one was, do multiple clips above each other affect the tracker? Um, and if I go back to Final Cut here and just zoom in a little bit, uh, you can stack as many things as you want. In fact, I'll just turn these other ones on. I had dropped them in previously. Those are two separate objects um, that are also tracking to the same the exact same thing. So you can stack as many things as you want uh, on top and have them track. It's pretty cool. And there was another question about um, the different analysis methods that you can use uh, on a track. And what do they mean? And let me just back up a minute. Um, the tracker is deep. You know, you can sort of get the the, the bits of it pretty quickly. You drag stuff on top of video to track. But in terms of where all the pieces are located and what to do when a track doesn't work and the different methods, it's pretty deep. So we actually uh, created a, uh, a tutorial dedicated to this subject called Mastering the Object Tracker, which should be up on my screen right now, uh, which is about an hour and 20 minute tutorial that really goes into depth on all the features of the tracker, everything you can do with it, and how, you know, really focuses on how to fix tracks that don't always work right, because it doesn't always work the way you want to or expect to, and how far can you push it? So this tutorial goes in depth on that. So if you're interested in really getting to know the tracker very well, you might want to check that out. It's, uh, it's on sale right now. So I just wanted to plug that real quick. Um, but to answer the person's question here, um, here I have a track, and this is done with a, a new plugin that we're having out shortly, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and the track is very smooth. If it's not always as smooth as you want, you can change the analysis method. So if I select the underlying video clip and go down to the analysis method, uh, by default it will say automatic. But there's really two different ways it can analyze a clip with machine learning or a point cloud. Uh, combined means using both, and automatic means that Final Cut will choose what to do by combining them or choosing one of them. Frequently, if you have a track that's a little too precise, it's tracking every little bounce and movement, switching to a point cloud and reanalyzing will, will give you a smoother track, uh, which is what I did here to get a nice, uh, consistent, smooth track on this snakehead. So uh, those were a couple questions about the tracker that we had submitted earlier. questions for a moment because there's still some one in there um, so one question any tips on importing GoPro raw files into FCP 10 um, well I Final Cut doesn't support GoPro raw and I'm not even sure what GoPro raw is honestly you maybe have to uh, give me a you know email support or email me directly um, my understanding I, everything I've ever shot with my GoPro 9 has been like mp4s it's there's nothing raw about them um, so I'm not sure what you mean. So perhaps some clarifications, but I can pretty much assure you that if it was shooting some form of GoPro raw, it Final Cut does not support it. Okay. Uh, let's see. Go ahead, Mark. Sure. Just another one, just trying to get to the people who've submitted stuff in advance. There's a question about is a cinematic editor available on Intel Max? And, and the answer is yes. It, it's not a matter of the Mac. What it requires is Monterey, as we mentioned before, but it will work on uh, Intel or M1 Max. 
And the other thing I've seen questions about is, will the tracker work on Intel Max? Yes, it'll work on Intel Max. It'll also, it, the tracker does not require, um, let me be more broad, 10.6 does not require Monterey. It requires Big Sur. Um, so as long as you're running Big Sur, you can upgrade to 10.6 and take care advantage of everything except for the cinematic mode on iPhone 13 clips, which requires Monterey, which you'll be able to do soon. Awesome. So there was a question about, did Apple ever fix broken Blu-ray build? But bro, I'm sorry. Did Apple ever fix broken Blu-ray build, build it to use the way it used to? Is Blu-ray gone for good? Um, I, I haven't burned a Blu-ray disc in probably... I don't know, six, six or seven years. <laughs> so long. So this is really a question for you guys out there in the chat. Is anybody out there burning Blu-rays? Does it work? Do you run any problems? Uh, that'd be really cool if I can direct them to your chats. If uh, if you're if anyone out there is burning Blu-rays, you could put that in there. That'd be really great. Okay. All right. All right. So. Looking back to the questions here, um, so Mark, yes, uh, there's some questions in there about I think man one or two questions about uh, uh, the, well there's some comp compression questions and there's another tracker question here a lot of questions about yeah the tracker. let me just address the tracker questions okay. um, there's I see at least one more how does the new tracker feature compare to your product yeah and when would you use one or the other that's actually a really good question because. Um, uh, they're probably referring to the fact that our Ripple callouts complete and um, our Ripple um, uh, tools complete include trackable features uh, through FX Factory. And those continue to work. Um, honestly, I think this tracker uh, is better to use on those. You can keep using those, uh, those plugins, those title packages, and they work great. You can use the tracker that's built in. But the, the Final Cut Pro Tracker is, it's faster, um, it's more flexible. With the built-in one, if you trim the title, all of a sudden you have to reanalyze. With the Final Cut Tracker, you don't. It's, it's amazing. You can trim your title, you can shift it around, you don't have to reanalyze. You can even retime a clip. You can do a blade speed, and it'll still all keep tracking. So um, I think, it's, uh, I think the, the Final Cut Pro one is better in that case. I will also mention, however, um, uh, Motion VFX has a product called M Tracker 3D, uh, which is very cool and very different from the Object Tracker and Final Cut. And that M Tracker 3D uh, is definitely still useful for situations that are very different from what the Object Tracker does because it kind of tracks an entire scene that allows you to um, do things you really couldn't do with the Object Tracker. So that that's how I would respond to that all right just uh, answering questions in the, in the text as you're answering them all right sure sure yeah uh kwai gene thanks for answering that anyone else that using blu-ray let's go ahead and put that in there thank you thank you for that really appreciate that um so i'm looking looking backward so uh, this came up twice and i frank i didn't want to uh i didn't want to miss you. thank you for posting again frank frank mitten Mittens, have you dabbed, dabbled with tattoo style masking and tracking since the new update? If so, somewhat realistic. Do you, do you know what he's talking about? Tap, tap, tattoo style masking and tracking? Uh, he probably means trying to like attach something to a surface. Right. And, um, and you know, I address that in detail in the tutorial. I think surface tracking, it, it, this is not a planar tracker, uh, but you can do some pretty cool stuff. Uh, in fact, let me see if I have an example here I can show you. I'll bring it up in just a second. I just want to see if it's available. Yeah, so um, here, I mean, this might be a good time to talk a little bit about RT tracking essentials. Yeah, um, yeah. You, but here's just an them, example them a, where yeah, I've tracked yeah. to a surface. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let me, let me talk about that for a minute. So what I have found, let me go back to the on screen. What I have found is like when you want to track stuff, what do you track? You know, there's a lot of titles built into Final Cut Pro, but they're not always the right kind of thing. So, um, and we have things in different packages that track, but I, there's a certain things I always want to track over and over again. So we've created a, a, a small package of the things you'd want to track, I think, the most frequently, and it's called RT Tracking Essentials. And I want to show it to you here. So um, 
it consists of both titles and effects. So under RT Tracking Essentials, we've got these nine title objects. And over in the effects browser, if I scroll down to RT Tracking Essentials, we've got these three. And I want to start with these because these aren't as obvious. Uh, so for example, I've got this shot of Steve here. And let's say I'd like to blur that logo. Um, you know, we don't have permission from Disney, so I'd like to blur that logo. So I'm going to take the hider and throw it on that clip. And it blurs the whole thing, but I can add a shape mask and I can uh, shrink that down and move it over it. And then you notice if I select the tracker, the tracker's in the same spot, and then I'll analyze that. And it'll analyze forward, doesn't matter where the playhead is, it'll analyze forward and then it'll go and analyze back and analyze exactly where that is. Um, and then what I can do is switch to the shape and unlink it from the tracker. And maybe I want to make that shape a little smaller or shape it a little bit differently or rotate it, just kind of get it right where I want. And then if I want to hide that shape, I can click on the shape mask icon in the inspector. And maybe I'll also reduce, reduce that blur amount so it's not quite so blurry. And that will now uh, track to him. So if you need to blur or pixelate, you can also cho choose pixelate, um, blur or pixelate a logo or a face, identity. Uh, you can do it very easily with this. Final Cut does have a built-in sensor effect, but it doesn't cover the entire screen. So I think this works a little bit better. Here's another example where I've applied it to multiple faces. So I've got um, somebody blurred right there, somebody blurred right there and somebody blurred right there as, as the camera moves through the scene and it blurs each of them. Uh, where they move off the camera, I did use a couple of keyframes to make it stick because obviously the tracker will lose it, but it's really fast and easy to do to have that work. Um, the other product, which is even cooler, I think, is called the cloner, and it lets you remove objects from a shot. So for instance, here we've got this um, couple of, I believe it's people on horses on this drone shot moving across the beach and uh, I'd want to hide them. So if I just drag the cloner onto that, and once again, because it's an effect, I go add a shape mask, I'll switch to the tracker and scroll, you know, make that very small and put it over them and analyze it. And I love, this thing's really pretty darn fast. Again, I'm, on, I'm not even on an M1 Mac. This is a 2019 MacBook Pro. Then I'll switch to the shape. I'll once again unlink it. I can zoom in really close to see what I'm doing here. And uh, I don't need nearly so much feathering and this doesn't need to really be as large. So I can do something like that. And then what I can do is because it's a cloner, I can replace, I'll just move those over and replace them with nearby pixels. I'll move all the way out and once again, hide that mask. And now uh, I've removed those people from the shot. Uh, an even more dramatic example is this guy, this parasailer, if I want to remove, let me play the clip so you can see it. So I've got this parasailer uh, coming in there and maybe it's distracting. So I'll throw the cloner on that. Once again, add a shape mask and I'll go to the tracker and I just want to track the parachute itself and analyze that parachute. Does it very quickly. Then I'll switch to the shape. I'll unlink it from the tracker so I can move it independent of the tracker. And I'll make it a little bigger and not so round and rotate it so that it kind of lines up to this parachuter, shrink it down a little bit. And once again, I'll just uh, clone those pixels from nearby and just like that, um, we've removed that guy from the shot. So kind of a cool effect. Uh, the third one over here, I'll just show you quickly, is called uh, Glint and Glow, and it lets you add glints and glows, but to specific objects. Like I've got this shot with all these candles, and if I throw it on the shot, uh, it affects everything. I'm just gonna increase the glint streak so it's pretty obvious what's going on here. So it's affecting everything, but I don't want that. I just want to point one thing out. So this could be, you know, headlights on a car or, or anything where you want to isolate something. So I'll, again, I'll switch to the tracker and I'll put it on that candle, shrink it down and analyze it. And 
And now, once it's done, we have this uh, shape mass. I don't even need to adjust it, right? really. It's just set to go. If I play that now, we've got that isolated to that one candle. And you can even you know, animate the glint angle to change as it have it move as it plays. So a great way to add little glints and glows to highlights and isolate them to objects. Here's just another example. I've already added it. So it only affects this candle and not the fire behind. And then I've got the, um, the hider bl uh, blurring out that label. And then these guys here are part of the titles. I'm not going to go through in detail in the titles because um, it's kind of obvious what they do. But they allow you to add track, you know, simple trackable pointers and uh, text to video. Things like that or things like this. Or you can use them in a highlight mode like this where you identify something in a shot and just use a built-in tracker. Or here, this kayaker, if you want to highlight him. Uh, or the snake, as we already saw. Or you can distort these to a uh, surface. So here I have that tracked to um, an object on the wall by using the distort tool. So uh, this is not out yet, coming soon, still in development. Uh, but I wanted to get you a sense of what it is and what you can do by combining these things with the tracker. It's really, I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Oh. Tracking Essentials. So um, just remind everyone, uh, the chat window is open. The doctors are in, and we're here to uh, <laughs> solve all of your Final Cut Pro and motion uh, problems. Well, that's a little hyperbolic, but uh, we're here to answer your questions. Um, well, and while we're waiting for you to um, post more questions, I'm going to jump back to our pre our pre submitted questions. Yeah, there's still some more in there. Yeah, too. there are a few uh, some. Um, okay, you did the analysis, so, okay, so there's, someone asked about how we do our breath sounds, um, <laughs> let's see, I, I, oh, yeah, I, yeah, number you know 22. What? yeah, I might, I may have come back to it only because I have to set that up, and while you're demoing something, I may have to do that, so I'll come back to that, um, so someone asked a question, uh, about something I did, uh, we, we like to demo a lot of products on our channel, we, j we just did the, that little teleprompter, and a few months, I think maybe a year ago, I demonstrated this little box. I, I didn't bring it up. It's called the tour box. It has little buttons on it. and allows you to control. Um, it's, you know, it's really cool. You can set it up for lots of things. <laughs> I, I used it for a while, and then I just went back to using the keyboard and the mouse. Honestly, I'm just so fast with the keyboard shortcuts and a mouse. I, I actually find, I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, say that they're not useful for, you know, certain things like color grading or maybe some sound. Um, I just found that it just got in the way, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I'm just saying, you know, it's a, it's a cool device, works well. And, if you know, if you really feel like you need to have a control service, that would be a, a good one to get. Um, but I don't, I don't use it anymore. <laughs> Let me address yeah. um, uh, Talisto's question. Sure. And thank you, Talisto, for your donation. He asked, how can I track an object and then lock it to stay in the center of the frame like the Beats by Dre video? And I know what you're asking. I don't know if it was you posted earlier. There was a Facebook post about the same thing. There's been multiple posts that basically are asking, can I stabilize the track, right? Can I track something that's moving in the frame and then stabilize it so it stays dead still in the frame? And the answer is, I don't believe you can. Um, I need to play with that more but i've been through this thing it's a fairly deep and at least in final cut i don't think you can do that right now mm -hmm. i i think it's a great idea um but you can stabilize you can track you can stabilize a shot you should stabilize a shot before tracking because if you stabilize it after it'll lose the track um but in terms of stabilizing a track itself i don't see a way to do that um so it just brings up the, the whole object tracker. I had a couple people were like, oh, this sucks. It doesn't work at all. And they're like trying to track the side of a building in a, in a flying shot or something. And it's just, it's not a planar tracker. Um, although you can do some pretty cool planar stuff with it. Um, it, it, it really isn't, in my opinion, it, it's not designed to do that. I, I will show you a shot here um, where I've taken uh, the Ripple logo and tracked it to a phone where I've kind of moved the phone forward and backwards and I rotate it. So it's tracking position, rotation, and scale. And it's not absolutely the perfect, um, but it does a pretty good job. Uh, but you, if you really wanted to do sort of like um, screen replacement, uh, that kind of thing, go to motion and use the four corner pin because a four corner pin built into motion is 
that's what it's made for to do that. So you can get away with a fair amount of surface tracking. I showed a few things, but it's really not designed to, uh, you know, be a full blown planar tracker and definitely not a 3D tracker. All right. So I'm sorry. So I guess I was muted. So I, <laughs> Travis, so I'm sorry about that, guys. So I was talking, we were talking about uh, removing breaths and room tone. Let me just repeat. Uh, here you can see some breaths and room tone. We don't all have whisper rooms and we a lot of times get rid of this. And I said, noise gates aren't, they work, but often um, you end up clipping or off, you know, the, a small, like a t or a s sound. I, I'm not a fan of, so we, we do things manually. So what I do is I have a under uh, under the command set customize. I have a pre-built like kind of preset. So for example, if I'm using the range tool, which I use for this, I want to get rid of this section. You know, I select it, and I already have a keyboard mapped to the S key. So if I tap S, it just drops it to silence here. So what I do, this is literally how I work. Hey, uh, hey, guys, I'm still being told that the audio is gone. Um, it might be a delay. Uh, audio should be back. All right, he's saying that it might be back here. Okay, I'm just I'm asking folks to see yeah. if they can poke. Can you guys say something in the chat if you can hear now? All right, just want to make can sure you hear me, guys? Can you hear, can you hear yes. me? Yes, All right. good, Sorry. good, Sorry. thank you. The reason you were muted earlier is when you were chatting, uh, yeah. the keyboard is yeah. loud in the mic. So I apologize to everybody, <laughs> trying to save everybody's ears from the key typing. I'm gonna make Travis climb <laughs> our granite mountain. All right, uh, anyway. So hopefully, did you guys hear everything I said about the, uh, I just wanted to make sure you heard what I said about the breaths and my, my keyboard shortcuts about setting this up and I mapped a keyboard so I can just press S and knock, knock out the, knock out the, uh... so basically what I do is this, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. By the way, I, I don't use command plus, I have just plus and minus. So what I'll do is I'll play and as, and then I get, I, I'm always ahead of it, S, S, so I'm always ahead of where the play it is, like this. So that's what I do. I just I'm always a slightly ahead of the playhead. I make a range. I press S, and you can and and you can actually get through a voiceover in real time. And this is my method to getting rid of that stuff more than a noise gate because um, a noise gate just creates more problems for us. So awesome. that's my workflow. Steve, that's all great. Thank you. Um, so there was a question from Colonel Sean. Uh, what does toggle storyline mode do? Default G. I don't know what that means. Toggle storyline mode? Yeah. Do you know what that means? Uh, no. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't know what it means. <laughs> I, I love looking. I love looking at the comments. Like I can hear, good, hear, yeah. yeah I know. Well, there's a delay. People are watching on a delay. So I asked, and nobody said anything for a long time. And like, oh, there's no sound. And then all of a sudden, like 500 people, yeah, it's good. It's no, not a problem. Right. Sorry, no worries. That's good. It's all good. Hey, you know, the one, the one thing about doing these live shows, you know, things, you know, things sometimes don't always go as planned. I mean, I remember one time. <laughs> You were you had a brownout and you were trying to do it from like Starbucks, you know. And, <laughs> oh yes. man! And then we did one where you were in Belize once, right? And that was kind of fun too. Um, yep. But yep. you know, even we, we we both have really good uh, internet connections, and we 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 set all this stuff up the night before. We tested in the morning. We rehearse, and even with all of that, there's still 
There's stuff goes wrong. Yeah, still, yeah. yeah, shit still happens, right? So <clears throat> it just happens. So <laughs> there was a question from Midland Pictures about elaborating on watch folders feature added a compressor, and I just added the link in the chat to your Steve does a, a, a full breakdown on that. It's best just to watch that. What's new? I mean, it's a it's a, it's like four minutes long and we'll explain everything about watch folders you need to know. It's really excellent. So I check that out. Axel is asking a question. Lowenstein, Lowenstein uh, where do you guys work on your sound design? I often switch to resolve working on sound. Um, we, we've used, we used lot, we've used uh, logic. We've used, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> Fairlight. And honestly, we, we do mostly YouTube videos and Final Cut has pretty much all the, uh, 90, 95% of the time, really, we do it in Final Cut because all of the Logic plugins are built right into Final Cut. I, 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 this question comes up all the time. Do you need to round trip to Logic? Well, for us, our workflow, no, because the Logic plugins are there and we can apply them to a role, a parent role or a sub role. We can do pre mix downs. We can do everything we need to without ever leaving the app. So uh, to answer your question, we use Final Cut for our audio post. We rarely use anything other than and a yeah, too. yeah. So we rarely, according to my audio guy back here, Travis, we rarely use, we use two things. We use compressors and channel EQs for pretty much everything we output to get the sound where we want it. Great. Hey, I'm just posting. People are asking for the sessions, meaning all the what's new videos. So I'm just posting um, all three again clearly in the chat. Uh, you guys should definitely watch those. Those are going to help you uh, get up to speed on all those new features. Um, so check those out, uh, please. If you haven't done them, subscribe to the channel. We are we're really trying to get to 100,000 uh, subscribers by the end of the year because why not? It yeah, would be a, it would be a nice holiday <laughs> gift. It's a, it's uh, quite it's, the, it's quite a challenge. Uh, those of you. Um, who are you know are YouTubers and want to build channels? The um, I, I don't want to discourage you, but the, the level of commitment is is insane. I mean, we're you know we're working you know, doing tutorials and, and trying to get even one video out uh, is is challenging sometimes. And then getting a video out that you have to get it out at a really high quality. You just we just can't we have to put it out at our, at our standards. And you know typically a, a video um, just. A video will, will take you know, any, a minimum of a short one or under 60s will take us like a minute. Our longer ones will take anywhere from two to three days. And so it, it is, it's quite a bit of commitment to, to get the quality there and then to post them. And um, so, you know, if you like this channel, we're saying, we're asking you to subscribe. So we'd love to, we'd love to hit that. Um, it'd be a, it'd be a good milestone for us to, for us to hit. Um, and also too, while we're bringing it up, um, you know, if there's some specific subject matters that you would like us to cover on our channel at some point, please l let us know. Um, we're always looking for ideas. We're looking for um, input, creative ideas for, for future for future YouTubes. I, I, Mark and I are kind of, we really like gear, so we talk a lot about gear, but there's so many channels on gear. So we've been focused on posts. So I'm just, we're just curious of something, you know, that you would like to see more of. Um, I put it in the, in the chat. That'd be really, really great. Um, okay, so uh, any more? Let's go back to the a couple more questions in the pre-submitted question. Uh, I'm gonna make sure we hit all these. Uh, okay, FC. So there was a question about. Okay, I, 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 okay. So someone had. I can do. I can do a few here. Yeah, go ahead. There was a couple of hardware questions. Sure, go ahead. What is your opinion about... Um, go ahead, what? No, no, you, you were talking. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's your opinion of using a Mac Mini as a home version of my work system? Currently, I shuttle drives back and forth between my work Mac Pro and home Mac, both, both 2011 era models. We're scheduled to upgrade my work Mac Pro in Q1, and that will render my home Mac incompatible. Yeah, the Mac Mini is great. The new one, the M1, is, is great. Um, I would just throw the, the new Mac Pros into the mix too, but the Mac Mini uh, is, you know, Alex Lindsay, who is very smart and who we have a lot of respect for, just is using a ton of Mac Mini M1s, absolutely loves them. Uh, so I, th I think that's a great potential solution. Um, there's also a couple questions about compatibility. 
of um, their older machines, a couple of people with 2013 Mac Pros, you know, they call them the trash cans. And <laughs> will it be compatible? And and the answer is yes. Um, I am going to, I'll copy um, this link and put it in the chat because um, the, the you know, this is straight from Apple. Uh, if it will let me paste it. Copy link, address, and paste it. So this is the Apple compatibility list for machines. But if you've got a 2013, late 2013 MacBook Pro, it's going to work with uh, uh, with Monterey, actually. Big Sur and Monterey, so 10.6. Uh, but after that, you know, you, you're really going back a ways. You're back, you know, eight years back. It's pretty amazing that it's compatible with the current operating system and current Final Cut. Mm. Uh, but these 2011, you're starting to really push it. So there's a question about 32-bit float audio recording um, that a lot of uh, devices are recording. Uh, road, road, road devices are recording 32-bit float, like the Rode Wireless Go 2, which which I recently purchased, <laughs> and they're sitting on my desk still. I haven't even had time to open it yet. But um, does Final Cut support 32-bit float? Yes, it does. Uh, and it's something that just happens transparently. There's nothing you set. It, Final Cut will look at the, should look at the entire, you know, full uh, spectrum or the full bit depth of the audio, and uh, you should be able to adjust it. I haven't played with it. I need to play with it, so maybe we can revisit this. But I found it interesting that, what is it, the 32-bit uh, float accommodates up to 1,528 decibels, uh, which, is, which is incredible. So you can think of it as like dynamic range for audio. So you have, a, you have all this extra headroom. Um, we haven't played with it that much, so I, I would definitely want to revisit that in a, uh, in a future Ripple Live or even a, a Mac break. Um, I'm going to address a couple that have just come up here. First of all, Daniel had a great suggestion, which I think is right on, and I'm going to have to do a demo of this immediately <laughs> because it makes perfect sense. Like the, 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 the beats effect, in other words, stabilizing a shot yeah. by um, tracking it, you can definitely do in motion by tracking the camera. It totally makes sense. You just track the camera to whatever object, and the camera is going to keep that object right in the center of the frame. Holy so crap! Daniel Suzuki, that's a gr that's a great that. idea. It's absolutely, absolutely brilliant. So um, <laughs> that's great. We'll definitely have a a you know a MacBook Studio or a quick tip on that because that's awesome. Another reason for motion. Another reason for motion. Um, but I was wondering if there's a better quality. It doesn't say. Uh, it just says on the export settings. I think it means in Final Cut computer format in the new Final Cut update. Right. I was just wondering, there's no better quality option. I don't really know what that means. <laughs> um, I think maybe there used to be a quote, better quality. I mean, in the view pop-up menu, you can switch, switch between better quality and a better performance for playback, but that doesn't have anything to do with export quality. Export quality is determined by the export settings of which there are a ton depending on you know, the codec you're using, et cetera. So uh, I'm not sure. Maybe it's just uh, mixing up the view, the playback viewing options versus export. Um, Resolve versus Final Cut. Well, we, we don't look at it as versus. We look at it as um, use the best of both of them. Yeah. And we use both Final Cut and Resolve mm -hmm. quite a bit. Yeah. So, um, you know, if you need to do deep color correction, uh, and it used to be if you needed to do tracking faces for color correction you'd we'd go to resolve but you can do it in final cut now you can track faces and do secondary correction it's fantastic so super excited for the object tracker for that yeah so where we're, go, go ahead Steve, no no sorry. i think you're right i mean we, we've answered this a number of times um people always ask us what is your preferred editor well final cut um we, we love final cut but we do use resolve for certain things i mean they have the the fairlight page is really great for audio post as I said, we do most for us. We do most of our audio post right here in Final Cut. So we're 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 huge Final Cut users in terms of you know the uh, just the simplicity of the UI and it's powerful and um, I, I have to say that I'm pretty happy that I mean we we've had almost I think about forty thousand views on our video and universally positive and uh, praise for the for the for what Apple has done. They've you know, given us a tracker, yeah, it's taken almost 10 years, but, but it's, you know, it's a tracker done right. It's tracker done in, in, in the way Apple could do it. And, uh, you know, I just, I feel like I want to address that. I mean, there's a couple of, there's, a, there's 
there's some complaints that where where's all this where's all that where's all these features and I think in the past we've gotten used to updates that just you know well it's got 40 features that we've been asking for are there I, I don't I don't know if you know I, I'm just happy to get regular incremental updates with features I can use uh, and yeah right? and bug fixes and bug, too. Fix it, and bug right. fixes and, and honestly it seems like you know people a lot smarter than me uh, Chris Hawking and others who are digging into uh, sort of the underlying underp underpinning see a huge amount of work going on under the hood in Final Cut in terms of first there was the, the, the you know the, the transition to metal mm -hmm. Uh, there's a lot of stuff being done in Swift now. So I think there's a, a great deal being done in the underpinnings that are going to allow more and more to happen on top. And that, that seems to be what's happening is uh, they're really preparing this to be able to lay new features on top that are going to have great performance. So I'm psyched to see what the future brings. By the way, I just wanted to go back on this whole color Final Cut Resolve thing. Um, D Creative Vision asked, is there a way of working in ACES color profile for color grading. And I would say it isn't exactly a color profile. It's kind of a, a system for color grading and you cannot do that in Final Cut. That's that's definitely a Resolve thing, whether you want to work in Resolve's color management or in ACES or no color management. Uh, Final Cut has its own color management with Color Sync um, where it's managing everything throughout the pipeline. But if you want to work in ACES, that's definitely something for Resolve. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm 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 really happy with this. I'm just kind of going through any last questions here. Um, our, I'm going to go back to something. It was, uh, oh, the HDMI. Let me let me switch something really quick. Okay. Uh, yeah, while you're, no, doing, yeah, while you're that, doing that, I'll do this. Okay. Uh, Ernesto says, "Sorry to keep asking, but can you comment on what you do for your live sessions? Are using ATEM minis or tools like Ecamm Live?" So we did. Steve actually showed that I'm, at I'm the bringing, beginning. I'm bringing, this, I'm bringing uh, it up again. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're bringing it up again. Yeah. Okay, great. Great. Yeah. So you can address that. Okay. Yeah. So uh, just let me know when you're. Yeah, I'm ready. So, go ahead. So, uh, you okay. can see, how's that? Oh, that's what. There we go. <laughs> can I do a there we go. flutter cut? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't, don't talk. Sorry. You're get sorry. Some sorry. <laughs> okay. So, a lot of people want to know what, what, uh, how we're doing the stream. So, we, of course, here's our, here's our main MacBook. That's what I'm demoing on. I've got a iPad connected to my uh, MacBook. And the output is going uh, USB-C, and we're going in. Well, the Mac is going into the ATEM switcher. Yeah, HDMI. HDMI. We're going out of the MacBook into into the uh, ATEM HDMI, and that would be you know input two, and then input one is our. I have a Canon C1. Oops, Canon C100 on back three. there. Oh, sorry, three. So you can see, I have a Canon C100. And there, there's, there's C3PO. So there's, there he is. Hi. And uh, so I can see 100. And then we have two Macs over here. We're running OBS on our Mac Pro, and we have a separate screen of Mark for the feed of uh, that his feed from um, India NDI, and NDI feed from Skype. Yeah. So that way I can see what he's doing. Travis here is monitoring our OBS feed. So everything from the ATEM uh, switcher is going into OBS and he's monitoring the feed yeah. and our mics, yes. And I think one thing I would say to help people is the ATEMs, Steve and Mark both have an ATEM. They're managing right. the switching between their camera and their computer. I'm managing the switching between graphics and their separate feeds and the side-by-side. -side. So there's like a two-layer switching going on. Mm -hmm. And we utilize, the ATEM minis are wonderful, we love them, but they're limited when it comes to graphics. OBS helps is wonderful when it comes to playing media and graphics and layout and all of that. So that's why we're still utilizing OBS, even though we love the A10 minis. So. Right. So that's right. that's our setup. Yeah. So I'm on. I'm I'm similar. I don't. I don't. So he's doing OBS. I don't have to deal with that. I just have the same A10 mini, or actually, I have the the original A10 mini. Um, and I can just, you know, tap a button to switch between um, my interface and my camera at will. And I last Ripple Live we did, I had the same the iPhone hooked up as well and could switch to that one as well. I just didn't hook it up today. So, yeah. Yeah, cool. Uh, I, 
So it's 12.25. Do we still have any questions we need to answer? You've got the ATEM to show your desktop screen. How do you do this from ATEM software? No, we're not using ATEM software. You can, but you just you just feed your computer as a uh, HDMI you know, source. an HDMI input. Uh, yeah, mirroring so, the so the camera's a source and the computer's a source. And, we, and, and, we have, and you have to mirror the display. We mirror our display of our laptop. So that the, the, right. Yeah. So it's mirrored. It's like the laptop's treating the ATEM as a display. There you go. Laptop is treating the ATEM as a display. Kent, uh, thank you for the mention here. He mentions that color finale will allow ACEs within Final Cut. Okay. I did not, I did not know that. And I, you know, there are a couple different third party plugins for color correction in Final Cut. For me personally, if I want to do more than Final Cut can do, I'll, I'll go to Resolve, but there's some good tools out there. And that sounds like if you want to work in ACES in Final Cut, oh, now this color finale sounds like it's the way to go. It says it's not 100% ACES pipeline. So good to know. Thank you. This is what I love about this show is we get all, all these knowledgeable people contributing, answering other people's questions right here, and then where you get to learn as well. Yeah. So uh, What's behind Mark? A photo? I'm oh, no, I... this is a real studio behind me. This is just, uh, yeah, <laughs> not a photo. <laughs> uh, so someone asked how we deal with noise i we shoot a lot of the we uh travis and i shoot with the a7s3 we don't use cards we record to an atomos ninja 5 and you know because it's by that the signal is bypassing all of the in-camera uh noise reduction we we do get noise in that 12-bit file and I, I tell you for me there's no better noise reducing software than neat Video. I'm, I'm sure most of you are out there. I, I, it's just, it's in video, video noise reduction. Video noise reduction. I, I think that's what he said. No. Well, anyway, if it said audio, I'll call it. But yeah, for video noise reduction, we we love neat video. That's just, it's just great. Okay. Cool. Um, awesome. All right. I think we pretty much. Any any last questions? Now would be time to ask. I think we've pretty much gone through our list, there, buddy. I think I think we have. Um, if you've got a last question, post it. We're gonna. I think we've been an hour and a half. We need to wrap it up and move on to some other things. But we want to really thank you guys, everybody, for um, all your support for coming to this, asking your questions, for supporting us with buying our tutorials and our plugins, and uh, following us on YouTube. All that stuff allows us to do what we do. Yeah, for just a living. So just a reminder. Thank you. Just a reminder. Uh, Mark's excellent tutorial. Um, it really goes into all this stuff about tracking and you know uh, how to really make it work the way you want it to. It's on sale right now. It's regularly forty nine. It's on thirty nine. So I don't know how long it's going to be on sale, but you know here would be a really good way to support what we're doing is is purchase his tutorial. It, oh, by the way, it comes with I didn't mention it comes with the media for following along, and it also it also comes with a plugin. You know that uh, that thing he showed where he uh, tracked. I think he tracked somebody. He made it. Oh, it was a horses on a beach. We include the free a free plugin in that tutorial that allow you to do that. So that's part of that. Um, also, if you have any specific questions related to anything here, uh, you can you can email support at ripple and we monitor that. Anything else, buddy? Um, I don't think so. This was uh, great fun. Again, great having you guys all come and hang out with us for a little while. Mm -hmm. Uh, we will do it again if you want us to. <laughs> and uh, we will see you guys later. Yes. Okay. Um, where's the link to that tutorial? Oh, let me post it for you right now. Uh, copy and paste right there. There you go. Um, questions, support at rippletraining.com. And... Uh, I guess that's it, Steve. Hey, uh, Good hanging out with yeah. you again. If you have any, if you didn't, we didn't get to your questions. You could always use support at Ripple Training, and we can answer you, uh, answer your questions. So yeah, we do our best to answer all of them. And uh, thanks again. You guys have a great weekend, and we have more stuff coming to show you. So can't wait to look look for more videos coming up. And don't forget to subscribe. We do want to hit that hundred K. Uh, so thank you again. Thank you for your support. Thanks everybody. Take care.